Welcome back to the, uh, the second of three LISA instrumentation parallel sessions at the uh, 14th LISA Symposium, in the second part of this session. And we're going to start off with Thomas Schwartz from the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Hanover, who will be talking about um, progress towards a flight phase meter analog and digital signal chain demonstrator. So if you're ready, Thomas, you can unmute yourself and um, on you go. Thank you. No, we're not hearing you at the moment. I'm not quite sure what has happened there. It worked earlier. What about now? That is better, yes. We can oh, hear right, something. Perfect. Very good. Sh should I adjust more or is it, is it okay? I think, well, if you can make it a little bit louder, that would help, but um, it's certainly perfectly audible. Okay, so next try. Okay, oh. I think on you go, yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, sorry about that. So, and thank you for the introduction. So I will tell you about um, our efforts towards a flight phase meter, and in particular, uh, the, what we call the signal chain demonstrator. So it's an intermediate step in the whole development process, and I will also put it into the context of the former and the future work. So a short recap of what the phase meter is actually uh, yeah, supposed to do, or what are the requirements imposed uh, to it. So we can see here um, a classic LISA long arm interferometry simplified. So we have our, um, our local spacecraft transmitting a laser beam towards a remote spacecraft. We have here our face locking. So uh, yeah, having basically sending a face copy back. So we have here our interferometer with a very long arm and a very short arm. And this beat note from the interferometer is then captured by uh, our face meter. Naturally, because we want to detect gravitational waves that are very tiny, um, we need the speakometer precision, with, which translates into a microradian precision for the phase readout. Um, due to the Doppler shift between the spacecraft, uh, yeah, we have a heterodyne, heterodyne beat node between 5 and 25 megahertz, taking account um, the offset phase lock. Due to the what I just mentioned, this huge arm length difference in the interferometer, uh, we get we basically see all the laser frequency noise up to a factor of two. So in the phase meter, we need a high dynamic range because in the end, the laser frequency noise is only removed in post-processing in TDI. So the phase meter needs to capture this really noisy data, but still with a very high precision. So that's what we call high dynamic range. And naturally, we have many, many photoreceivers, also quadrant photoreceivers all over the constellation. So we need um, yeah, a multi-channel phase meter. So many channels, which is might sound trivial, but it's not. So to start with, in 2013, in a collaboration between AI and um, DTU and Axcon in Denmark, there was uh, the elegant breadboard model, elegant breadboard model developed. So basically a TRL4 model. So you can see here a picture of the breadboard, and there it was shown um, that it performed very well. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, in a split test, for example, you can see here. So, uh, meaning you compare this um, signal, uh, the, the phase meter channels with similar signals. And we can see here the performance is well met. So, uh, the requirement is here the gray curve and also with a high dynamic range. So, this blue rogue line above gives you the input signal uh, dynamics. And uh, this is then mitigated in the split test. Also, we performed some more sophisticated tests, namely uh, the three signal test. You heard about that um, just a couple of minutes ago by Kohe. So here, however, in this um, very early test, it was um, performed with one phase meter only in contrast to what Kohe showed you with uh, several phase meter and clock tone transfer. And also here, the phase meter performed very well with other noise sources um, limiting the final performance. For example, you can see here in blue uh, photo receiver noise back at the time. So this was at uh, 2018. Okay, um, yeah, but you probably believe me that this you cannot just put onto a spacecraft. So we need to uh, increase the TIL level and also naturally put it into, well, together with that, put that into a proper housing. So um, that is 
uh, a picture of, a, of the goal, so to say. So we would have then uh, a proper housing with uh, thermal management and also very importantly with space flight um, components. So all the electronics here, um, there you cannot just put them into space. So we needed to move to uh, components that have space flight equivalents, in particular FPGAs and ADCs and more, but I will, I will mention that later. We have to take into account redundancy. Um, for example, you can see here in one of these modules, 16 channels, and they are servicing actually eight um, quadrant on photo receiver channels. So there you can see already called redundancy. Um, but yeah, let's take a look into what we would then describe as the EM, so TL6 EM. Uh, I would also like to mention the next talk then by Esteban, who will, will go into much more detail here. Um, but let me quickly summarize the different modules. So on top, we have the power supply unit, which is providing um, yeah, the power to all the other modules. Then most importantly, we have four, so one, two, three, four backend electronics um, modules. So these are the actually, the, it's an important part that reads out the, the photo receiver and the interferometric signal. And uh, we have four because, um, yeah, let, let's go through this. So this one, for example, is for the test mass interferometer. There we have 16 channels, as I said, in code redundancy. Then down here for the reference interferometer, again, code redundancy. And here two modules with eight channels. And those are meant to read out the long arm interferometer in hot redundancy. Because there we have very little power and we need to get every, yeah, every word that we can get. In the middle, we have the frequency uh, distribution module who provides clock and pilot on to all the other modules to uh, make sure that every sample is properly yeah, timestamped or that it's possible to timestamp every sample properly. And on bottom, finally, the housekeeper, the data handling and laser control system who will then bundle all the data from the different modules and send it to the onboard computer. A uh, nice, yeah, nice side effect of this is that the modules, you can develop them separately. And this is exactly the idea of the signal chain demonstrator. So um, it's then a separate development or a parallel development, if you want. And it will consist of then an eight channel card. So similar to, to what we need to read out um, uh, yeah, eight quadrant photo receiver channels together with a custom PCB. And in total, it will give us an analog backend electronic plus the digital backend electronic. And together, it, it's almost a one-to-one -one copy of the actual EM backend electronics. Um, because we don't have a DHLC here, then we will replace that with EGC equipment, um, for example, space wire, uh, yeah, bricks, and, and so on. And the overall goal is to uh, verify that the sig complete signal chain from analog to digital uh, works with space flight uh, components. And that was then we uh, had to take another intermediate step. And now I will tell you about what we call our proto signal chain demonstrator. And this is due to the fact that um, components are very hard to get by these days. Um, and also custom PCB layouting and routing, it takes some time. So here we, uh, for first prototyping, we went to a version where we can operate with a uh, FPGA evaluation board, which you can see here on the right side. Actually, it's an RTG4 by Semi, And you can buy this then uh, as is, just off the shelf. And we could then focus our effort for now on the analog electronics. And in this prototype, we have then a four channel uh, analog front end or yeah, back end, um, which is, uh, we couldn't go to eight channels right away because we're limited here by the FMC connectors and the amount of bits we can transmit as the ADCs we are using uh, here uh, have a parallel interface. In any case, this is supposed to serve then as the first characterization tool for the analog front end as well as um, for as a platform for the um, firmware or the synthesizable logic slash firmware and software developments. So let's take a closer look in the analog part. So as I mentioned, um, our what we wanted to achieve is to, to get actually space components on, on the board. And here we, exact, we did exactly that. So we use ADCs, although single channel for now. So in the former prototypes, we use quad ADCs, uh, op amps, voltage regulators, and also clock buffers uh, have now space flight equivalents. And what is new in the topology of the design is a new uh, variable gain amplifier. We tested that separately before, but this is the first time that it's integrated in the full signal chain. And this is important um, if the signal levels in LISA vary 
for so from let's say in the long arm interferometer we get probably very low signals but still we need to adapt these to capture the full range of the adc so, so the full voltage range of the adc so that we don't get additional noise there um, then for the digital part in the beginning, uh, we used a provisional design, which was very, very simple, just to be able to read out and characterize the analog front end. Well, yeah, sorry, I'm switching between back end and front end because we changed the nomenclature at some point. Sorry about that. Um, in any case, so the, the, the digital back end then reads out um, the, the, the incoming data in a very provisional design here with just PLLs and pilot tone correction and dumps the data into some VRAM and reads out via JTAG. So this, of course, is not the final version. And we are also limited to bandwidth, but it does the first purpose. So we were able to characterize um, our prototype. Uh, and the analog part, I will spare you yeah, all the, the pain that went through the debugging in the analog part. Um, and I will just show you then the results. Uh, you can see here also a nice housing. And it's actually, this doesn't require any active control anymore. So no more active temperature control as we needed in the EBB, for example. So that's already a plus. Um, and I should mention that in the measurement, I will show you the, the new VGA for now is bridged because we were first wanted to verify the topology that we, that we had before, but now with the new spaceflight components. Um, yeah, that's another picture with the classic bubble wrapping. Um, yeah, some of you might relate. And this is then uh, the result of the, the, the final measurements, or let's say preliminary final measurements. Um, and actually I went one too far. So this one first, so you can see here the performance uh, is nicely met, yeah, except this little bubble here. Um, so that's a, a big uh, milestone for us. And I plotted also the temperature stability here, um, because in the next plot you can see that it seems to be the limiting factor in the moment. So you can see here with, uh, with a deteriorated temperature stability, performance also deteriorates. So that's something to investigate further maybe. Um, so, but yeah, let's, let's keep that in mind. Performance which was reached here, so that's very important. And now let's go from the analog part to the digital part. So as I mentioned, we had this provisional design. Um, of course, now we're working to get this to a proper digital infrastructure. And the requirement here is, as shown here, uh, we have some scientific data that uh, comes in, uh, that is decimated, so uh, yeah, beat node frequency phases, whatnot, and also uh, additionally the output of an FFT running on the FPGA at a different um, speed. So this is done for, for in particular in acquisition that's important to capture the beat node or for amplitude estimations, this kind of stuff. Uh, and on, on top, so this is just data streaming, streaming in and wanted to be read out, so to say. And on the other side, we have uh, some, some quasi-static control registers that need to be set, uh, like configuration data, like PLL gains, uh, VGA gains, and so on. And also other peripheral components like DDR memories for, for um, storing diagnostic data and flash memory for um, for some persistent data. And all that needs to go into some kind of bus system, which is then finally connected to Spacewire RMAP. And our approach is to solve it with the GRLib of Cobam Geisler. So it provides some uh, IP cores for the interfacing here. So we will then solve the data processing with some, um, again, with some block RAM, but only as temporary buffer, which can then be read out by the HB bus or more precisely by HP master from the space wire. And this is how the data transfer then goes on. And on top, we have some registers that we can set for the mentioned configuration um, and also then the interfaces to our memories. So that's just a schematic. Here you can see uh, our ongoing developments actually supported by Lutz from uh, Lutz Puttelmann from Airbus. And here you can see um, the, the full schematic. And actually this is already, um, implemented, um, but only yet verified in simulation. So that should be mentioned. So you can see here in the middle, the main bus, the HB bus, uh, and the top left here, the DSP. So all the, where all the data that I just mentioned comes from and where the configuration registers need to be set. And also uh, important to mention here in the top right corner, we have some debugging system. So with the soft core processor, Leon 3, uh, which connects to the outside world separately. So there we can inject and read out uh, bus commands um, 
independently of the actual connection um, to the to the DHLC and to the EGSE um, with the space wire IP core. But yeah, this will prove very useful um, for future developments and debugging. Also, you can see here then the peripherals that I mentioned, the flash interface, DDR memory. So the DDR memory, of course, needs a high-speed connection to the DSP, but then the tickle-down data that goes via the downlink um, is going again through the HV bus. Yes, and that is almost it. So let's let me give you an outlook. So um, in the onlook side, what we will do next is to include the VGA. So it, at the moment, uh, I told you it is bridged and integrated into the whole topology. And important is here, of course, to also verify its phase fidelity so that it doesn't disturb our performance. And once the full chain is completed, we will then also put some effort into analyzing the transfer functions uh, for proper characterization. And on the digital part, um, so I just mentioned that we have a working system in simulation. Uh, then at the moment, um, Lutz on the Airbus side is working on putting the thing into silicon, so put it on the chip to uh, then commission also the space wire. And uh, we on the AI, AEI side, we uh, our job then is to connect this infrastructure to our DSP core, to the yeah to the heart of the phase meter, so to say. So finally, then we want to have a system uh, on chip where the DSP is uh, able to talk to the EGSE equipment via space wire. And also uh, important to mention in parallel, we are developing or implementing an FFT that fulfills the requirements uh, for LISA, which is quite strict. So it needs to be very big, so 8K. It also needs to be live, so it's streaming data, so every sample counts. And um, this, these requirements actually uh, are more than um, as IP cores from the vendor can handle. So we need to put some effort there to do some custom development. So let's go to the conclusions. I told you about the uh, signal chain demonstrator, which is an intermediate milestone um, towards the flight phase meter. So it tests already space ready, uh, space ready components, and its goal is to verify the complete signal chain, which is I would or which I would consider the core of the LISA phase meter. And most importantly, here we uh, per, um, achieve performance with a four-channel prototype on the analog side, or well, well, also connecting um, using, of course, the digital PLLs but um, also using the critical analog part. And on the digital side, we are in the progress of um, developing the digital infrastructure, which is based on the GR lib of Corbin Geisler, and it already works in simulation, and yeah, further work is ongoing. And with that, I would like to finish, and thank you for your attention. Excellent, thank you very much for that, Thomas. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. I'll maybe kick off. You mentioned sort of thermal stability or maybe thermal drive to the uh, the performance, I think, particularly of the analog front end. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe say a little more about that? Do you know, or do you have suspicions at least about which particular part of the, the front end is sensitive? Uh, so, so we have some, um, yeah, some suspects for the, for the noise coupling. Um, so one is uh, what we would call uh, then, yeah, the, the finite phase response. So if you imagine the, the transfer function, or well, actually I'm now I'm, I'm confusing things. So, so let's start again with a with the transfer function. So um, yeah, the so all the components, analog components in the in the front end or back end, yeah, um, they define the transfer function. And now if temperature is fiddling and it's fiddling on the so values of resistors and so on, the transfer function will uh, change slightly. And also then, uh, especially when you have a, a very a noisy um, input signal that is going back and forth on the transfer function if you want, and then if you wobble on the transfer function, you get uh, increased phase noise. Uh, of course, so which component exactly now? So which resistor? I, yeah, I don't dare to tell. Okay, a couple more questions have come in. Um, the first one I'm just going to read out. So, are the 150k gates in the RTG4 enough for the entire phase meter? So, in our um, yeah, first, um, yeah, how you say, um, in our first uh, layouts, so which 
were based on on on, yes, on the old or well, not old but on the already used um, code in the EBB and also some new IPs. So we made a preliminary um, estimation and there we hit uh, 50 percent. But of course, uh, yeah, only the future will tell when everything is properly implemented. So of course, uh, we hope that it's enough. But yeah, we we um, targeted for the preliminary design uh, occupation of 50 percent. So yeah. So we have still some margin. Okay, uh, there's a couple more questions. We'll maybe read out one more and let you answer the other one offline in the chat, if that's all right. Sure. So how, how much of the phase meter is actually built and you know, essentially how much of it is actually TRL6? Yeah, for that question, I might actually refer to, to the next talk uh, by Esteban, who might know more about all the different modules. So I picked now the, yeah, the signal chain. Um, yeah, he, he might uh, be able to tell you actually more details about that. Okay, that, that sounds a beautiful way to sort of segue into the next talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. That was a very interesting talk on the phase meter. Thank you. And we'll now move on to Esteban Delgado, again from uh, Albert Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Hanover. And the title of the talk, which will probably appear on the screen before I manage to read it all out. There, you can see the title of the talk. So again, it's a, we're told, a slight continuation of the, the previous talk, talking more about the phase meter. So please take it away, Esteban. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? So, yes, no, that's fine. Okay, thank you. So yes, um, my name is Esteban. I'm working for the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics. In, in Hanover. In this uh, uh, presentation, I'm going to report about the uh, status of the engineering model of the uh, standard phase measurement system, um, EPMS, or in short, uh, LISA phase meter. So um, as mentioned in many different presentations during this LISA symposium, so the gravitational wave signals couples as very tiny phase fluctuations in the interferometric arms. And the LISA phase meter is the uh, in chart of extracting the phase information from these um, interferometric signals. So um, basically, the uh, phase meter is a, is a core instrument on, in the LISA payload. And as you can see here in this representation, in this figure from here, it's where we have a couple of phase meters per spacecraft. So this uh, represents uh, one, one spacecraft and the interfaces, the electrical interfaces with the, um, with the phase meter. So basically the phase is reading out the interferometric signals coming from the optical bench. The optical bench populate three different interferometers, the long arm, the test mass, and the referent one. So the, uh, there is a total of 12 QPRs in per optical bench with results in 48 optical readout channels per phase meter, where 32 of them are operated in nominal uh, configuration. And the most stringent uh, optical readout in long arm interferometer because of the, uh, as mentioned by Thomas, due, in, uh, due to the uh, low optical power levels. So there is one uh, phase meter instrument reading out the interferometric signal from the optical bench. That means there are two phase meter per spacecraft and each of the phase meter um, provide the internal redundancy um, inside the same, the same box. The phase meter is also the laser system. So for the laser system, so the phase meter is providing the activation signal from the phase and frequency uh, control of the uh, improbability based on, on, on temperature, just to be able to perform the laser transponder uh, configuration in LISA. But also the phase meter provides the auxiliary functions um, that are necessary for iteration with the laser system, like the optical uh, data combination, the clock side mass modulation, or the several ranges estimations that are necessary for particularly clock side bumps and, and, and peer and ranging for the time delay interferometry uh, post-processing on ground and for the extracting of the gravitational wave signals um, at the end. The phase meter is uh, synchronized with the other subsystems and synchronized uh, with the platform based on the central timing unit. The central timing unit basically it's uh, incorporated one 
ultra stable or in the entire uh, spacecraft and all the subsystems including the phase media are synchronized and locked all the uh, internal OSTE data to, to this central timing unit. The phase meter is delivering the output data for DFAX operation and for the SI measurements to the onboard computer. That at the end, the onboard computer will transfer the data to on ground for further processing and gravitational wave signal observation. If we see more in detail the application of the unit, so I was uh, preparing here so a basic table on the uh, top scientific requirements that require verification on the engineering model. So one of the requirements is the multi-channel readout capability. So from the optical bench, uh, there are coming 48 independent readout signal uh, that are processed per each of the uh, of the phase meter. 16 of them are operated in cold redundancy, meaning off at the end. So the uh, phase meter is in parallel 32 channels at the engineering model level. The frequency range for the um, it's given by the Coupier from an electronics bandwidth. So and the uh, heterodyne frequency is designed in the range of 525 MHz. And the most stringent phase fidelity is at the end obtained from the uh, uh, top uh, frequency, the 25 MHz. Obviously, in the uh, measurement band of, the, of, of LISA, the frequency band. But particularly, one of the one is the optical path, uh, path and then noise uh, precision that it's achieved. Uh, for, uh, it's necessary for this uh, phase meter instrument to be one picometer uh, per square root of, of hertz at one, one millihertz, which is equivalent a phase, phase noise fidelity of one microcycle per square root of hertz. So this uh, longitudinal displacement is not the only uh, stringent requirement for scientific performance, also the angular readout noise. And we have a requirement of five nanoradian per square root of hertz by applying different the operational condition of the instrument is to operate in particularly for the long arm interferometer, the most stringent one with the very low optical power levels. So we are assuming to have 100 picowatts for the assigned uh, operation per coupier, and then take some percentage of the optical power light for the auxiliary functions like the clock side pumps, um, clock noise transfer or for the absolute ranging and, and data communication. 10 picowatts for clock noise and one picowatt for absolute. However, the phase meter also operates in a very noisy environment, noisy in terms of the uh, phase fidelity. So the sensitivity of the, uh, of the instrument is one microcycle, but it's operated in a very high dynamical range due to laser frequency noise, for example, with several orders of magnitude above the sensitivity of the instrument. The bit nodes are moving um, uh, in frequency due to the Doppler effect, due to the um, uh, spacecraft motion here per, per seconds and to get rid of some instrumental noise particularly the ADC timing jitter so the quality of the signal or the phase fidelity of the signal synthesized inside the instrument require a high precision timing timing noise requirement so it's 40 femtoseconds for the 25 meter which is equivalent to the 18 micro radians per square root of hertz for piloton signal at 75 meter the piloton signal is a signal that we synthesize internally in the phase meter to be able to get rid of the ADC timing jitter as one of the instrumental noise of the uh, of the phase meter, as well as uh, providing the auxiliary functions like the ranging accuracy with submitted accuracy. So another of the instrumental noise is the thermal stability. So as mentioned by Thomas in the previous slides, thermal noise is our enemy. Let me say it's coupling um, in the phase noise performance. So we require a thermal stability at the uh, thermal reference point, typically of 0.1 heads and this is where some of the operational conditions for the uh, for the instrument. The phase meter is not only reading the, the phase with high precision but also it's operated on a spectrum analyzer in some um, operational scenarios like in this uh, in big note acquisition uh, procedure that's part of the constellation acquisition so we implement the FFT uh, algorithms with 8k points at 80 megahertz as well explained by by Thomas, uh, that is also one of the uh, features and one of the uh, key uh, aspects to be implemented and demonstrated on the engineering model. So this is basically so the uh, the the track of the uh, of the third requirement. So the optical uh, data transfer is um, uh, required at 60 kilobit per seconds um, to to transfer the data between the uh, 
the spacecraft will be effective of 60 kilobit per second. We are transferring data much faster, as explained in previous slides by Kohei. Uh, we, we wanted to guarantee in the uh, transmission uh, on the optical, optical data. So the output data rate at the moment for the engineering model, we are assuming to have four hertz for the uh, scientific readout, 16 hertz for DFAX operation, and about 10 kilohertz for the FFT readout, 9.7 to be um, precise, as, as mentioned by, by Thomas. And standard to the uh, other uh, instruments of telemetry at one hertz. And all of the, the uh, USO from the external reference from the timing, uh, central timing unit. So all this uh, requirement has been flown down and, 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 and moved to a hardware implementation. So we are proposing um, to have a flexible design that based on a modular concept, as well as playing also by, by Thomas. This is because we are able to develop, manufacture, um, and, and test individual models for assembly in the overall, the overall, the overall unit. And also, um, this has uh, many other benefits. Uh, that's why we propose to have this flexible hardware and software configuration. So as explained before, so the, the phase meter is consists of four backing electronics that are the one doing the interferometric signal readout. The frequency distribution system, that is the one that is locking the instrument to the external reference and synthesize all the necessary clocks inside the uh, instrument. It is a control that it's a module that is inter interface with the onboard on computer, transferring the data for DFAX operation and for the uh, scientific uh, readout. And the power supply modules that is at the end the one that is providing the uh, all the internal voltage to the uh, to the to the unit and also the QPR uh, power bus line. So we have some estimates on the mechanical and the thermal interfaces. At the moment, the unit is, uh, is, is heavy, improving the, the mass and the power consumption. So the mass is calculated to 29 kilograms and the power consumption of the unit is 134 watts. So if we see the inside of the meter, so this is what we are trying to represent here in this block diagram. So basically we have four backing. So we distinguish between two different types of, of modules. So one of the type of modules is are the ones that are limiting the performance as critical modules. Critical are the backing electronics that it's doing the uh, interferometric readout and the uh, fast uh, digital signal processing task. And the frequency distribution module that is the one synthesized the uh, pilot on signals, which is at the end uh, limiting the noise floor of the, of the instrument and synthesize all the internal frequencies locked to the external reference and is also critical, uh, a critical module. So for critical performance modules and the one that require our concentration at the moment is the backing electronics and the frequency distribution one. And then we have uh, the different uh, DHLC and power supply that we categorize like central support modules are obviously important, very, very important for the, uh, for the unit, but it's not um, limiting the noise floor of the, um, of the, of the performance or the uh, scientific um, output of the, um, of the instrument. So it's doing the unit management, the state control, and the last uh, destination filtering from the backing electronics and also providing the data in the format required by the, uh, by the OB, OBC, the MOA computer. The DHLC also implemented the uh, controller for or the DAC for the uh, frequency control of the uh, laser in the uh, laser transponder uh, topology. And the power supply is the one that is distributing all the internal um, powers and, and the power of the, of the... Basically, as you can see in this diagram, so we have four backing electronics. One FPGA is reading out two QPR, so at the end, so we have four ATG4 in the in the unit, not only one. We are calculating 50% of the um, of the usage for this ATG4, as well mentioned by 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 Thomas, but just for the readout of of couple of of QPRs. So we have four uh, ATG4 FPGAs in the uh, in the um, in the unit. And all of them, all four backing electronics modules are synchronized with ones who are getting the data from for, for the DHLC, collecting like in the uh, CPU processor here of the uh, uh, DHLC all the data and then transfer the data to the um, 
to the onboard computer. And in the frequency distribution module, so it's where we are just generating all the different frequencies necessary for the TG4 FPGA, for the NG Large, for the ADCs, and for the pilot tom, among others, in a single electronic module here that is locked all the frequencies to the external reference one. We can see here some preliminary modules of this, uh, particularly frequency distribution or the power supply modules in the first proto versions. Esteban, so, just to interrupt briefly, about two minutes left. Oh, okay. Um, so at the moment we are concentrating, thank you very much. So we are concentrating in the performance wise critical modules. Those are the uh, backing frequency distribution one. So you can see here a representation of the mechanical frames on the backing electronics. We have two PCBs. One is the analog backing electronics. The other one is the digital backing electronics. Um, in the frequency distribution system, so we have the BCXO frequency distribution system. That is the uh, one that is locking the instrument to the external reference. And on the top side, so it's the clock uh, frequency distribution one that is emphasizes the clock side bumps and the pilot tone signal. So at the moment, we're, we're concentrating therefore in selection of the AAA part as well by, by Thomas. So we built a four channel demonstrator. We are escalating these electronics to our eight channel version for TRL6 demonstration. So we expect to have the TRL6 demonstration by the beginning of next year to cope with the mission adoption schedule. And this is where we are at the moment in, in terms of performance, limited by thermal noise in the lower frequency region. So we have uh, digital backing electronics in a custom design electronics, as also was mentioned by, by Thomas. At the moment, we are doing the field one development based on this space development kit for the ATG4 space um, uh, PCB, but we are building the uh, schematics. Uh, well, the schematics has been done, the PCB routing is ongoing, and the mechanical frame also ongoing for this custom design uh, digital backing electronics processor that is the, the one that is doing the, the magic of the, uh, of the Lisa phase. So the LISA phase meter will be tested in different uh, environments, optical one particularly. So we are building and upgrading the LISA. This platform will verify the angular readout noise of the, uh, of the instrument. So we are upgrading the uh, test facilities to be able to, to test the multi-channel phase meter. So, um, and this is what we are expecting to, to have uh, just ready uh, by, by next year. So the hexagon agreement, so I'm not going to enter much in detail because Jorge was explaining quite well this uh, uh, experiment from here, but this is the, the final platform to verify all the different modules. Start from the model, go on to the coalition models and afterwards the flight uh, models. So in regards to the schedules at the moment, so we are, we are here uh, building the TL6 demonstrator. So we start with the electronic test in next year. So we continue with the optical test next year, uh, 2024, and we deliver the unit to the IDS test campaign by, by the end of 2025. I'm sorry I'm going so, so quickly in this slide, but I think this, this is the, um, the key point is uh, next year. So we expect to have the, uh, the, the, the test campaign for the engineering model. So in summary, so at the moment we are uh, doing, giving priority in the, te in the technology readiness level uh, for all these performance wise critical modules, the backing electronics and the frequency distribution module. So we have started prototyping of the different uh, electronics when the uh, selection of the AAA parts and all of them are compliant. So this is the kickoff for the uh, detailed electronics design of, of, the, um, of, the, um, of the engineering model. So the moment where we are is the backing electronics is 100% complete in the schematics and we are doing the routing and the mechanical layout in the detailed design. The frequency distribution module is the same power supply module, so we are still in the schematics phase because we are still um, um, getting some agreement with the QPR working group in the interfaces with the QPR. The data handling, so we are still discussing with the laser assembly and um, responsible on the final um, interfaces to, um, to, the laser, to the laser system, and that's why we are still in the 80% uh, of the completeness of the uh, of these modules, and we are also working in the OGSC and the preparation of the unit level test with uh, optical optical setup. Thank you very much for for your time. I'm sorry for exceeding the presentation in a few minutes. Excellent. Oh, thank you very much for that. That was a uh, a lot a lot of stuff to get through in a relatively short time. Um, the one question that's hanging over from the previous one, but I think you probably really answered in that was essentially how much of the phase meter is actually built and you know, what is ready for TRL, TRL6 rather. And I think you said the plan was to have 
by early yeah. next year. Exactly. So early next year, so we plan to have the DRL6 demonstrators on mini mechanics and electronics by April 23 for these modules from here, backend electronics and frequency distribution module. So test in air by April 2023 20, 20, and test in vacuum at module level by June 20, so we call TRL6 uh, demonstrator. And then we will continue with the other modules. Uh, well, the other modules are obviously following a parallel sequence here in the schedule. Um, and the full assembly, so we expect to have the uh, um, the test ready is war, so by beginning of 2024, so meaning so the uh, qualification of the uh, full assembly with electrical test on 2024, and then continue with the optical test um, by, by this year, actually. Okay, thank you. Um, one other question, I think you, you mentioned, um, Sorry, somebody else is pushing a question, so I should rather go with their question than, than my personal preferences. So how are the values for the PRN chip rate and optical data rate linked? So as reported by, by Kohei in previous um, uh, presentations, so at the moment, so um, we are building um, the uh, DLL, uh, the, the control loop for, for peer and ranging and optical data transfer in silence FPGAs, so not in the ITG4, that is the protoflight version. So, and we are achieving so good performance uh, for, the, um, for the ranging accuracy, well below the requirements for the engineering model. And um, we still have some synchronization problems with the optical data transfer, but it's uh, been transferred as 28 kilobit per second raw data. So after the uh, correction of the, um, with Re Salomon correction and so on, so it's equivalent to 60 kilobit per second. So this is what we have as a requirement on the uh, on the specification of the unit. So one of the effort is just to complete this IP core. I, I say IP core is the control loop, the DLL, just to be incorporated in the uh, FPGA logic architecture presented by by Thomas. So at the end, so it's. Like the phase meter group is like building a course of the functionalities to be able to afterwards be integrated in the FTG4 based on some given FPGA logic architecture. Okay, thank you very much for that. I think we've kind of run slightly over time here, so I should bring that to a close. But if you could possibly look in the chat window, there's possibly one or two more questions there. If you could answer them there, that would be great. Thank you. Or people can get in contact with you directly. So thank you again, Esteban, for that um, Thanks to everyone. tour through the, uh, the phase meter building. And our final talk in this session is Jean-Baptiste Bale, who I, he is there indeed. Good, excellent. So this is a slight deviation from phase meter talks to, well, I'll read it out again, assessing the, the impact of orbital approximations using GPU accelerated response model. So Jean-Baptiste, take it away and tell us all about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, uh, for the intro. And yes, it's going to be a little bit of a different talk. Uh, let me just adjust the screen. All right. Okay, you should be able to see the screen. Yeah, that works. Um, okay, awesome. So yes, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, more on the data analysis side. I actually don't really know why this talk was um, put in this session, but that's the way it is. Uh, hopefully it's going to be of interest for you, for you guys. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about the response function of Lisa um, and how we implemented it using GPUs um, to have the full response and used it to assess the impact of uh, orbit approximations um, when doing parameter estimation. So this is a work that we have uh, We've carried out with a bunch of people, Michael, Alvin, Michele, uh, from, um, from different institutes, actually. Uh, and um, we've, so we've submitted a paper about it. So I'm going to describe basically all the results in the paper and the methods. Um, um, but you can go and check out on archive the paper itself. There's the link here. Um, and the title is actually exactly the same as um, the title that I've chosen for this talk. So that's an easy uh, pick. 
All right, so I'm going to start uh, with a little bit of context um, um, because we're talking data analysis here. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the implementation itself of the full response function uh, and how we used it to um, study different approximations related to orbits. And I'm going to leave you with a few takeaways. So without further ado, let's start and dive in into the context. Um, so a little bit of a refresher about Bayesian framework. So um, we analyze the gravitational wave signals using um, this uh, Bayes rule, um, where uh, we want to find the probability of having some um, a set of source parameters here, theta, um, given some data and a model, lambda and d. Um, and this is proportional to uh, what we call the likelihood. So uh, the probability of having a certain set of data um, given the parameters. Um, so L here um, is what we're trying to estimate, and it represents the probability of observing the data that we have given a model parameter. Um, so under the assumption of stationary and Gaussian noise, um, this likelihood, or more precisely the log likelihood, is proportional to, um, there's a factor of minus one half, uh, but it's proportional of this um, inner product of um, the data minus the template. Um, and the template is the gravitational wave signal that you generate um, during your sampling of the likelihood um, um, from your set of parameters that you're testing. Um, and so because it's a complicated uh, thing to explore, and um, usually you have a high number of dimensions, um, you want to use stochastic sampling like MCMTs. Um, and so you jump from one set of parameter to another. Um, and so because the parameters are changing at each jump, you have to generate your template again. Um, and because you wanna, you wanna uh, uh, have millions of jumps, um, your template generation itself must be very efficient if you wanna have a good sampling. Um, and you don't want it to take the, the Hubble time to finish. So um, as you probably know, Lisa is expected to fly in, in the early uh, 2030s, um, so in a long time, and the first scientific data will only come about a year after that. So in the meantime, um, the algorithms for short search and parameter estimation are developed and tested with simulated data. And that's exactly um, what the LDC, the Lisa Data Challenges are for. Um, and so if you're interested in, in that, then you can check out the LDC workshop um, that happened on Monday, and that's gonna happen again. Um, the different sessions uh, later this evening, uh, or um, a pre-recorded talk about time domain simulations uh, with Lisa Node and Lisa Instrument. And so what's important to know is that in general, it's a very complicated task. So to tackle it step-by-step, step, we usually consider simpler scenarios um, with different approximations like a static constellation um, so that we can go to the frequency domain where basically all the computations are a lot easier and faster. Um, and so we hope that all the effects that we miss with these approximations um, can first easily be added later um, on the templates that must match the, um, the hypothesis that we have in the injected data. And also that it do not, the, these effects uh, that we missed do not change the accuracy of the algorithms um, that we use. So these are two big assumptions that we need to check. And of course, during operations, the algorithms will run with real data. So we will need better templates that would include all the relevant effects, relevant being, you know, TBD, um, because we want to extract the maximum amount of information for the collected data. And so the accuracy of the model um, that we have of the templates should not be um, the limiting effect in our parameter estimation. And so the question is, can we do that efficiently? Um, as, as we said, we generate templates um, a lot of times. And so basically as a rule of thumb, template generation must be below tens, a few tens of milliseconds. And so in this, in this work, we propose to take advantage of GPUs um, to generate better templates um, efficiently and check um, those assumptions. So when we talk about template generations, um, there are two parts. The main one is, um, which is not even written here, is to simulate the waveform itself. Um, so the strain, the strain time series or, um, or frequency series. And then you have to pass it through um, the response function of, of the instrument, um, which has two main parts. Um, first, what we usually call the projection, which is really computing the response um, that's written here as yij. 
um, of the six Lisa links. Um, six because you have both directions for all the three arms of Lisa. And so the response is really the frequency shift um, that is induced by the gravitation waves. Um, so the deviation from the metric, uh, the mean curve metric. And so as you can see here, there's a there's a good um, equation for that. Um, and basically these big H's that you see, H12, um, are the projected strain that you take at different times. The second step is TDI. Uh, you've all heard about TDI. So because Lisa um, has unequal arms, um, there's an overwhelming amount of laser noise that we should reduce. And TDI um, does reduce it uh, below, um, hopefully below gravitation wave um, amplitudes. Um, and so usually you work with um, um, a set of TDI combinations here. Um, in this example, I take the Michelson one, X, Y, and Z, um, which basically gives you um, equivalent equal arm length measurements. Um, and we do that by taking the measurements that we have from our unequal arm interferometer, and we combine them and time shift them. Um, in practice, uh, we use second generation uh, combinations to account for the flexing of the constellation. But here, just as a reference, I show you the first generation X. So as you can see, it's the combination of the different Ys uh, that we computed in the previous step, um, on which we apply those VDs, which are just delay operators, time shifts. And of course, uh, because the data will go through this TDI step, the templates must also be transformed because we compare before we compare them against the data, the TDI data. All right, so as you can see, this is the, the response function. These two parts are quite complicated. Um, and actually, both of them uh, require some knowledge about the LISA orbits. So if you think about the projection, um, as I pointed out, the, the strain, those big Hs, um, needs, needs to be evaluated at emitter and receiver, so at different positions in space. So we need to know the position of the spacecraft. Um, and um, the third point here is that we also need to evaluate them at emission and reception times. So that means that given um, the reception time, for example, we need to deduce the emission time. So that's actually a rather complicated calculation because it involves computing the intersection of a light curve with uh, the spacecraft's universe lines. Um, but all in all, it also depends on the spacecraft positions. Um, and lastly, there's the antenna pattern function um, um, the projected H's, uh, which depend on the arm direction. So again, you need the spacecraft positions. Um, on the time delay part, uh, the time delay interferometry part, um, of course, we need to delay those Y's, uh, as I showed. Um, and so we need to um, estimate the light travel times, um, which are used as time shifts. Um, as the baseline, we obtain them from auxiliary measurements, uh, what we call the measured pseudo ranges and, and the slide bands. Um, and so that's a that's derived from the measurements that we have. Of course, the real orbits are influenced by a lot of things, um, other bodies like the Earth or Jupiter. Um, the orbits themselves are optimized um, for fuel consumption, for example, and then you have to add non-gravitational effects um, that are accumulated uh, over the mission. So it's a complicated thing. Um, here's an, here is an example of uh, a set of orbits. Um, I plot it here. Um, over the, I think, 10 years of mission, uh, the light travel times, so the separation between the six pairs of spacecraft, and as you can see, it's varying. Um, they're absolutely not constant. It vary, they vary by more than 5%, and they're not periodic. So this is complicated, and that means that to compute the full response function, we need to handle time-varying delays, which is not easily expressed in the frequency domain, um, it actually can with some tricks, but it's not easy at all. Uh, whereas it's very easy to implement this in the time domain. This is actually what we did. So we propose an implementation of the full response function in the time domain so that we can accept any strain time series or any waveform and any orbits. Uh, and we, of course, include this TDI step uh, where we can compute any combination. This is implemented on GPU, um, and there is an open source project uh, called Fast Lisa Response. Uh, I gave you the link um, on GitHub here, and it's implemented in C++ and in CUDA uh, and wrapped into Python um, with Cypher. So it's fast, it's really fast. Um, all the time varying delay filters are implemented as Lagrange um, interpolation. 
with a very a quite high order, a conservative order of 25. And so the entire likelihood that we um, we looked at earlier in the talk um, is computed on GPU and only transferred to CPU in the very end. And so this, um, this is pretty cool. Um, of course, the first thing that we did is to cross check the results um, against existing codes um, using CPUs. So Lisa, GW response or Pi GDI and the LDC toolbox. And basically um, all the tests that we did showed a match down to numerical precision. So we're pretty confident that uh, the implementation is correct. What about the performance? So um, we compared basically the CPU implementation and the CPU, the GPU and the CPU implementations um, uh, performed on, on some machines. Um, and basically what we see is a speed up of about a thousand times. So it means that for one year of data, the full response function can be computed in around 10 milliseconds, which as we said before, becomes compatible with the usual samplers. All right, so now that we have this, um, then we're free to use very realistic orbits and compare them with you know, very approximated orbits and assess the impact of those uh, approximations. So there exist many codes. Um, most of them actually assume equal arm length uh, orbits. Um, that's what's used, but for example, by the LDC um, or any fast Fourier domain response. Um, and as we said, some these orbits are in physical, um, but they simplify the problem a lot. So they're used a lot. Um, we're going to use our code basically to assess the impact of these approximations. So what we did is really carry out a systematic study of the loss of accuracy that we have when, um, when doing parameter estimation with simplified orbit assumption. In this um, study, we focused on galactic white dwarf binaries uh, because they're easy to generate. Uh, the waveforms are really easy. Um, they have um, little, um, small number of parameters. Um, and actually the waveform itself is generated on GPUs. So everything is quite fast. Uh, the seven parameters that we use um, are uh, the following, the amplitude A, um, the, initial, the initial frequency F0, um, the initial frequency derivative F dot uh, zero, the, um, the polarization psi, the inclination um, yoda, iota, and the um, initial angle. Uh, phi zero. So because we need to compare different types of orbits, um, we have to, um, so we are given the realistic orbits that I showed you, uh, computed by ESA, um, and then we have to use what kind of equal arm length orbits we want to use. So what we did is we actually fitted um, equal arm length orbits so that they're as close as possible to the realistic orbit. So we assume that we knew beforehand um, these real orbits. So it's basically the best case scenario. It's the best fit that we can have um, with equal arm length orbits. And then we consider three different assumptions on the orbit. In the first one, um, which I would call ESA orbits, this is the baseline. So we injected um, some um, galactic binaries, computing the response function with ESA orbits, realistic orbits, and then we performed the analysis using the same ESA orbits. In the second case, the equal arm length orbits in blue, um, this is the worst case scenario. So we did a realistic injection and we use equal arm length templates. And then in the third case, which is, um, this is a mixed scenario. We injected realistic gravitational wave signals computed with realistic orbits. We did the projection part with realistic orbits. And then we did the TDI part with equal arm length orbits. So basically this is, to study the individual impact of the arm, length, the arm projection and the TDI part of the response function. And, and then because this is- the, Sorry to yes. interrupt briefly, I had two minutes left. Thank you. So because this is a systematic study, we use different source parameters. So two different SNRs, um, some quieter binaries with an SNR of 30 and some louder sources uh, with 500 and the sets the amplitude. We um, sensed, two different sky locations near the orbital plane and near the polar, uh, the poles of, of the ecliptic and three different frequencies of our sources, um, which means different chirp masses. So rather small ones or 
basically higher frequency ones. And all other parameters that we talked about are just randomly drawn. Um, we just showed that they have a very small impact on the results. And here um, is the first result. So um, basically here, what you can see is um, the posteriors um, and actually the points with the little icons uh, represent the um, median. So the, the point estimates um, for the sky location. So you have the two sky location in axis, lambda and beta. Um, the true one um, is recovered using the ESA orbits. So this is an orange. And then the worst case scenario is this blue one. So as you can see, you have a bias. So your best estimate of the sky location is biased uh, from the true. And then you have the mixed scenarios. So one where we actually used an equal arm length for the TDI portion or the projection. And as you can see, they also biased in different ways, the response function. So the important thing is that for this loud low frequency source, we see actually quite a big bias, more than three sigma from the equal arm length case. So that means that actually the contribution um, of the response function model is quite important. That was kind of expected. Then the question is for different uh, parameters on the grid uh, that we just defined, what's the effect? And as you can see for low SNR um, sources, it's less striking, but um, in different cases you have um, a bias that is more than um, one or three sigma actually. Um, and for very loud SNRs, uh, you can really see a bias. So um, basically this bias examination was performed on the posteriors and um, for all the different uh, orbit scenarios, um, orbit approximations and across our parameter grid. Um, we estimated the sky location, the frequency, and we saw that these are the most impacted um, um, estimated um, parameters. Um, and the observations are actually fairly consistent. So basically low SNR sources have small biases and high SNR sources have strong biases, um, which can go beyond three sigma for sky location and frequency. We see that both the TDI portion and the projection part of the response function do contribute an observable bias. And other parameters that we didn't discuss here are also slightly biased. So the main takeaways is that um, when we move to more realistic scenarios, we definitely need to implement the full response function in both the projection and the TDI part to generate the templates. Um, we proposed a GPU accelerated implementation of this response function, uh, which allows to use the usual MCMC samplers and give posteriors, and this is publicly available. Um, and as expected, if you use simplistic orbit approximation, you have a large impact, a large bias on the parameter recovery. And for loud sources, basically, you cannot use it at all. Um, the last point, an important one, is that when we use realistic injections and realistic templates, we do recover good estimates of the galactic binary parameters, which means that uh, this one, one of our hypothesis, which is checked. Um, so it's, it's good that um, in the future, we can use those uh, implementations and templates. And thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, we are noticeably over time at the moment, so certainly. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, um, it's my fault, really. I should be more brutal about interrupting people, I feel. Um, one question that's come up in the chat. Um, do you see some breaking of degeneracy? Try that one again. Do you see some breaking of degeneracies when introducing realistic orbits? Um, not really. Um, oh, I don't have the plots, um, but um, you can see that. Um, so the only thing that you really see is that when you have um, not realistic orbits, so equal arm length orbits, um, some of the parameters like the frequency derivative um, is not well constrained at all. Um, and our interpretation of that is that um, you you use the Doppler shift. That means the motion of the of the constellation to constrain um, some of the parameters, like the frequency derivative. And when you're off, um, then your MCMC um, cannot really constrain those parameters. But this is this is not an improvement, um, really, from using you know realistic orbits. This is just just because 
using the wrong orbits, you, you feed the wrong information to your MCMC chain. Okay, thank you for that. Um, possibly worth having a quick look at the chat. I don't think there's any further questions there for you. I think if people have questions, they should just get in contact directly with whoever, whoever the speaker was for that particular session. So let me thank all the speakers for this, particularly for the second half of this, Thomas Esteban and Jean-Baptiste. And with that, I think we will close this parallel session for the moment and hopefully see many of you tomorrow at um, the uh, third visa instrumentation parallel session, which um, occurs tomorrow. I was going to, going to give a time for it, but it depends on your time zone. You can look it up in the uh, in the schedule and see. So thanks again to all the speakers and we'll close the session down there. Thank you all. <laughs>